distanced world, Design United is an optimistic digital platform for collaborative design and connection. In a socially distanced world, Design United is an optimistic digital platform for collaborative design and connection. Design United was created in March 2020 during a period of intense lockdown and quarantine measures within the region. The aim behind Design United was to create an optimistic space for regional dialogue, connections, collaborations, and opportunities for young regional designers and design practices. A much needed network of support and peer mentorship during these uncertain times. Talented young designers and design studios working on design innovation with an approach that is relevant to our South Asian region have been invited to be a part of the platform. We also encourage design students from the region to share their work, be involved in the dialogue, and to be an active part of Design United. Design United, most of all, believes in creating a community of designers and design knowledge that is largely contextual with focus on contributing to the environment and our community. Design United believes greatly in a spirit of collaboration and idea exchange. Good evening. Welcome to Design United's 28th Design Conversation, a conversation with three talented studios from our region, FAR from Indonesia, Manzil from Pakistan, and Studio Pomegranate from India. I'm Varna Shashidar, founder principal of a regional landscape practice, VSLA, based in Bengaluru. I'm supported by my wonderful DU and VSLA team in this endeavor, along with Clayworks Spaces. Clayworks creates flexible co-work spaces that focuses on productivity and sustainability. Clayworks now has a complete work from home solution and you can find the details on their website. I would also like to thank my wonderful team supporting me in this endeavor. The aim behind Design United is to create an optimistic space for regional dialogue with young designers and design practices. Design Conversation has featured talented designers from our region, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, selected for their innovative approaches and practices that also have a deep resonance with the place they are from. Design United features projects of design significance from the region, also provides an insider's perspective. We've also had brilliant mentors, regional designers with great expertise and commitment to mentoring younger generation of designers in our past conversations. I'm also very happy to announce the very first Design United conference. So please save the date, 15th November, Sunday. And kindly continue to join us for all of our design conversations. With this background to Design United, let's move to the much anticipated presentation and conversation this evening. I'm extremely delighted to welcome our presenting designers all the way from Islamabad, Jakarta, and Mumbai. Joining us today are Fawzia, Shweta, Pranav, and Rafi. Fawzia Evan India who is a part of architecture studio FAR based in Indonesia. Fozia and FAR, uh, Fozia started FAR with Andro Kaliandi and Azilia Martiza in 2017 as a design practice. Beyond normative architecture, the practice has been working on various scales of projects, playing with different styles, tweaking geometrical forms, narrating fun spatial sequences, and also trying out non-building material. 
they try to embrace a playful approach to design. Far is currently working on several private house commissions, renovations, retail work, exhibitions, and also toys. Fozia, who represents Far today, is one of the principal. She previously has worked with the renowned Indonesian architect Andrea Martin in Jakarta prior to starting Far. Our second presenting designer today is Rafi Abasi of Studio Manzil, which looks at architecture as a craft. Rafi studied in Malaysia, Pakistan, and more recently at the K KU Luvian, Belgium, where he ob obtained his master's in architecture prior to returning to Pakistan and starting Studio Manzil earlier this year. Rafi, along with his diverse background in his architectural studies, also has had the opportunity to work on projects of different scales in firms around the world, as well as notable firms in Islamabad, Pakistan, which includes Nasser Design and City. With his firm Studio Manzil, he aims to approach architecture as a handmade craft, paying special attention to details while creating a balance between design and functionality. Our final set of presenting designers today are architects Shweta Chatpar and architect Pranav Nayak, principals of the architecture firm Studio Pomegranate based in Mumbai. Studio Pomegranate was set up in 2013 by Shweta and Pranav. The studio explores opportunities for integrated collaborative design. They continually refine their design process and strive to discover and reinforce uh, the passion of the people they work with, whether it is in a search for meaning in design, the desire to serve communities through sharing knowledge and experiences, or understanding the power of new software applications. Architect Shweta Chatpar graduated with a Master's of Architecture from Savannah College of Art and Design US, specializing in digital architecture. She is the author of the book, Digital Urbanization of a Potter's Colony, Slum Redevelopment, Dharavi, Mumbai. While architect Pranav Nayak graduated with a Master's degree in architecture from Thalassen, the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture US. Pranav has extensive experience with hand-built buildings and shelters. He's also an active academician teaching and mentoring at architecture colleges in Mumbai. We're so pleased to have all the presenting designers today of Studio Pomegranate, Studio Manzil, and Far Indonesia. We welcome you all to Design Conversations. Thank you. We will start the presentation with Fazia presenting work from her studio, Far Indonesia. Hey, um, so hopefully everyone can see the screen. We can, thank you. Okay. Um, hi everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you the DU team also for the team of moderators for organizing a wonderful conversation today. Um, so usually when we are um, asked to do a presentation, um, there's usually already a brief or a theme to answer, but this time uh, Design United lets us choose whatever material we wanna speak about, which is um, actually great, but it uh, requires more thinking and planning. So it's been pretty tricky. Um, and uh, today I, I will be speaking on behalf of my other two partners, uh, Andrew and Ritza. And uh, we decided instead of talking about a particular project, we wanted to talk more about the things that are more personal and um, to be able to tell insights about um, our overall character um, as, as a studio and import, importantly, our design approaches as now we might have new audience and people that are might not be familiar with our works. Um, 
So the studio itself is relatively new. Our studio started in 2017 when I came back from uh, graduating my master's in the US and uh, finishing some internships as well. So it was only me and Andro before uh, Ritza joined us in 2019. Um, we've grown from a two person team to um, seven at the moment and we've been around that number of people for a while now. Um, as you see, we don't occupy a big space. Uh, our studio is inside a renovated two car garage. So it's roughly three meters wide and 10 meters long. This picture was taken recently before the studio became full online because of the pandemic, just to show the intimate scale and warmth of the space. Um, and so when we started, we actually talked about making studio statements and um, establishing some kind of design manifesto combining between our different interests. Uh, but in the end, we kind of just, um, decided to celebrate the freedom that we have now that we have our own practice to work on. Um, what we meant by freedom is we get to decide on things we want to have day by day in the studio. I think one of the biggest decision we made was to have a four day work. So we have offs on Wednesday, Saturday and Sunday. Um, we also spent a lot of time developing our logo um, our own human figures, um, as you can see, we have our own human figures um, um, in the previous um, slide. Also objects and uh, material hatches that we will show you as well. Um, and it's a collaboration with our good friend who is a graphic designer. And you will also um, see it um, in the next presentation. And for the rest of it, we just choose to let everything uh, flow and focusing on the process. Um, so next, I'm gonna go into our practice. Um, so the other important thing we talked about at first was the practice has to be, uh, it has to start with a blank slate uh, for the three of us and for our staffs as well. We, we didn't actually wanna limit projects, so we wanna be, um, open if anyone wants to try new things. So we're trying to be as open um, as much to possibilities. Um, on the next slides, I will show brief highlights on uh, several of our projects. So I'm not going into deep to each one of them, but I will just um, emphasize on different types of scales and also approaches that we think are interesting to share. Um, so hopefully you will get a picture on how diverse um, our approaches are in each project. Um, so this first project is actually, uh, it's, it's special because it is one of our first projects and the client is um, actually our best friend from undergrad. Um, we invested a lot of time in this project uh, because basically we did not have any other projects back then. So we did a lot of work uh, with it. It's a co-living space. So it's um, kind of like a boarding house. And the idea was actually pretty simple. So this is the plan. Um, as you can see, we wanted to step away from um, like a box room, like a typical um, three meters or four meters box room. So we try to stretch, um, tilt, and juxtapose boxes until we came up with two room shapes. Um, we, we call it like the, the minus room and the plus room. So if you can see, there are like two types of room that is not a box. Um, so uh, both cater similar programs, but with, with different experience. Um, the project is well underway. Um, it's expected to finish early next year. Um, and so far it's been good. Um, the next one uh, would be a renovation project which underwent a pretty major change from the existing um, structure. And in this project, I guess we are very driven to the character of the client. We try to focus uh, 
to narrate a story about the client through their house. So, so it's, it's, it's basically like embodying them to an architectural form in a way we feel both of them are like prince and princess living their fairy tale. So we channel that energy and came up with a castle-like um, language for the form. Um, so as you can see, this is the initial plan before the renovation. It's, um, it's with straight walls. And another thing we want to solve from this house was the lack of natural ventilation um, because our interns almost fainted when they surveyed the house because they don't have any open windows at all, which is crazy. And as you can see um, in, this, uh, in the renovated plan, we pretty much kept all the structures and main partitions, but we completely changed the facade to curved walls. So yeah, this is their castle. My, my, my favorite part is actually the balcony where it feels like you can wave to the civilians. And um, this one is a small house that is nearly done. Um, our team are now escorting the client's move, um, uh, move in these days. Um, and what's interesting about this house is um, we tried using um, like diagonal and oblique lines that um, that translates into triangle spaces and angled corners here and there, as you can see. Um, and even though we are fully aware that it's a small piece of land and designing something that consists of um, elements other than a square might be tricky, but we, we really took a leap of faith on this one. Um, there's also an indoor tree inside, um, a mezzanine and a long built-in table. We really think this is a fun house to live in, so we hope the client thinks their way too. Um, this one, um, this is a competition project, which um, I think it's the first competition we did and we actually won. So yeah, we, we usually didn't have so much luck with competitions overall. So it's a, a souvenir center for uh, Borobudur Temple in central Java, Indonesia. Uh, the idea was actually pretty simple and what I feel as a bit mischievous, it, it actually started by looking at the body of the temple, uh, really focusing on the stacks on the platforms and um, if we see it as a plan, like from above, uh, we kind of just then separate the planes um, and then kind of deconstruct it from, from what is a form of stack, like a vertically stacked form to something that is um, uh, uh, horizontally. Um, and so I feel this project has a pretty good clarity of idea. And I guess that was strong enough to give us uh, the first uh, place prize. Um, and the next one, um, this one is also a competition which we did not win. It is a competition for um, Indonesia's uh, curator selection for the architecture uh, Venice Biennial 2020, 2019, yeah, 2020. We started with some ideas and we kind of just threw them together. We, um, here we collaborated with a friend of ours who's, um, who's a, cur a curator and um, he was a part of the team and he actually came up with the idea of uh, working with the issue of global waste um, to answer the the brief, how will we live together? And we kind of also added the idea on focusing of having the objects only on the ground. So if you see this image, we, we, we really can just take away the context and just to have like a flat floor uh, benches. And the most important thing I think is the uh, moving rail in the, uh, on the floor. So we translated the, the notion of um, like the transaction of global waste as 
something that is moving, um, going from one country to another. So really embedding um, the motion and the design is something we really want to do. And uh, basically it's a resin block with piece of uh, a piece of waste inside, uh, mobilized through the, um, to, uh, around the space. And I think it's pretty similar to the renovation project we had before when we uh, wanted the, the design to embody something that is the drive of the project itself. And for, uh, and next up, this one is an exhibition project. So we also do um, lots of exhibition projects here and there. This is uh, a book fair in London and this is the um, Indonesian pavilion. Uh, so it's a pretty huge pavilion in a really tight space. Um, so this model really gives you a sense of the actual form. Uh, it has two stories. The ground area um, is more like a, it's a more stationary um, area while the upper level focuses more on the walking experience. So the form itself um, responded to the uh, branding of the pavilion, which uh, focuses on water and its movements. So we try to explore two different water movements. Um, one is the circling and one is, uh, and the other one is like a, it's like a linear wave. Um, it was built last year in March and the structure stayed for four days, I think four or three days. Uh, which I think is the worst part of doing a temporary structure. Like you work on it so much, you you fell in love with the design, and then the the next like the next day it's gone. And uh, apart from the exhibition space, when we were in London, we also um, like we sort of like decorate an event space. This is a reception event at the Design Museum London. Uh, following the book fair event, um, still along with the uh, idea of water movements, um, we explore another element of uh, water, which is uh, the water bubbles. So, well, candidly, we just picture the concept as the room is like sinking and everyone is underwater with the bubbles. Um, this, so this was the initial design, but turned out they only we have one hour to prepare the whole event. So we settle for less. Um, so we basically do some kind of um, like uh, creative direction, not only with the objects, but also with the lights. Um, next one, this is a stage project for an orchestra concert. We collaborated with um, an artistic director who briefed us with the idea of like a grand classic stage, which is uh, very associated to orchestra with red layers of curtains. So if you can see, we kind of translate those layers into a different um, form. Um, so, our so our design didn't turn out like a like the red grand curtains, but we wanted to like regenerate the nuance of the grandness and uh, from the layers of the heavy red, red curtains. Um, so in this project, which, um, well, which like the layers were cut more than half because of the budget issues, but I think um, it still works in, um, in like channeling the grand energy from the classic orchestra space. We also uh, did a project for cats. Um, so our friend wanted, wanted a nice house and playground for his pet. And so why not? We are also actually now working on um, like more of these. Uh, so we treated the project like a human scale architecture. So we did a lot of iterations and looking at their behaviors, um, which is super fun. Um, this should be like the last one. So this is one of our most recent projects. So this is actually a campaign for a smartphone brand. Um, we came up with um, 
like the idea of a like a daily situation, like a 24 seven thing and just insert the smartphone here and there to answer the marketing cues. Um, here we also collaborate with our friend who is the graphic designer who made uh, our patterns and uh, made our human figures as well. This is the process between uh, behind the scenes. And I guess uh, we all had fun working on this project because it feels like we're uh, like back to architecture school when we can do like a lot of silly models. Um, so uh, after like about three years as a studio, um, especially during the pandemic where uh, there are multiple webinars like, like now, um, like oftenly we were asked to share like our studio profile and then we realized maybe we should have something specific to say by now like not just like a um like a generic profile but what it is about us that is um different um uh, with others so by that time we look back to our projects and we kind of like concluded a character that we feel emerged multiple times and that is um, us being playful and uh, like playful about how we treat forms and how we create experiences. Um, and I guess by that time, um, like the stars aligned and we met our old friend, um, uh, Robin, who um, like from undergrad, who is finishing up his PhD in Columbia. And um, it's been a long time since we talked about a possible collaboration uh, between us. So, um, so we, we kind of told him about our practice and what we are thinking and that we wish to have like a place to exercise our ideas and design methods, but not through our actual project. So we are more looking like a side project and um, so, and his personal interest was mainly like Indonesian history. So we really want to incorporate that too. Um, our graphic designer who, uh, who worked with us before multiple times also, uh, Gema also came along to collaborate on the project as we share the same spirit as well. So we decided to um, like revolve around the idea of play and chose traditional games as like the, like a tool of expression, basically. Um, Dolanan, so we named the, the side project Dolanan. So it means, so it, it means like to play in Javanese. And um, so Robin introduced us to Johan Huizinga's book, um, Homo Ludens, a study of play element in culture which it really helps us um, to have a deeper understanding of the nature of play. And uh, one thing that amazes us in, is the idea of like an invisible boundary when you like play something. It's like you're inside a bubble and when a game or play is happening with all these rules and when it's over, the bubble just pops. Like we feel conceptually it is like very architectural. And so this is the pilot project we did in August. Um, so we set the timing to match with Indonesia's Independence Day on August 17. I know that India's is also like close to our Independence Day. And I think a big part of celebrating Independence Day for our people is to play games and um, being in competitions. And uh, one of the most classic game is uh, makan krupuk, which translate to eat the cracker. So as you can see, um, there's like a rounded cracker hang um, with a string and, um, and everyone should finish the cracker and without our hands as well. Um, and for the design, we, we tried multiple things, but we uh, initially settled with this one. 
So we start with the idea of like a hanging string and we basically just flip them so it's no longer um, hang, but now it's like placed on the ground. So it's like the opposite. Um, this is the piece. Um, so because of the pandemic, um, the celebration this year is different. Like we know the games are not played in neighborhoods like it used to be. So our idea was to send uh, like a game kit to our friends um, so they can still play and, um, and like organized um, a competition between them, but they can still stay at home. So this is the, I think it closed. Wait. There's like a video I will share. Is this um, a video of the, like how we play the, the game kit? So I think we sent out like a, a 30, um, yeah, like 30 something of the kit. And um, we think uh, we think it was uh, pretty fun. Uh, and, and I think like our like the our friends are also happy with it. Um, I'm gonna just do a share screen again. So, um, yeah, and also like to close, um, close the day that day we prepared a prize, um, like to close the celebration for the winners. So we also send out like the people who succeed in, um, in doing the game the fastest. And um, so it's also the end of the presentation. Um, Thank you for listening. And I hope this could give like a good insight about our practice. And um, we hope there could be something useful to take home. Um, yeah. I think I'm done. Thank you, Fozia, for such diverse, interesting work shared today and indeed embracing a playful approach to design and also emphasizing on the aspect of fun while designing. Thank you very much. Wonderful work. Uh, we Thank would you. now we would now like to request Rafi. Hello. To please share his work. Hi. I just dive straight in. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Fazia, for that beautiful presentation, and it showed that architecture can be fun. Um, I'm going to start with a research called Boundless. It is done with a studio streetscape and territories. The site is in New York and uh, mainly the United Nations building. The reason I decided to show this is that I feel a lot of uh, our viewers are students and I wanted to show them the importance of drawing and doing research before designing. So, um, the site is the United Nations um, building. And as we know that the United Nations and these buildings have very negative spaces. They have high walls, barbed wires and fences and they always try to push people away. So my research question is how can architectural interventions that create discontinuities also create unprogrammed activities? Um, here's an image, uh, the first one on the top. This is uh, the United Nations, uh, sorry, the American Embassy in Brussels in 1953. And as you can see, the building is 
completely open to the public. It has no surroundings. Um, it's open, it doesn't encroach any area around it, and it's a very welcoming space. However, after post 9-11, um, things changed. The current state of the embassy of the pictures below, where it eats up into the public space, is cordon off the street, as well as the street across. And even taking pictures of this area, a person is really hesitant. They're like, man, is, they're gonna shoot you or something. So they really eat into what spaces are meant for the public. And in a world that we live today, People are growing, amount of populations increasing, spaces incre uh, decreasing and becoming more and more valuable. Here is the United Nations in uh, US. And again, they've got barricades, cameras, these negative spaces, these intimidating spaces where they're just trying to push you away. I mean, why can't we use these spaces for something as collectivity or play games while also maintaining that sense of security. In an ideal world, uh, there's some images. Uh, here's a famous um, musician. He is playing in 1969. And along with it on the back is the Berlin Wall. The wall acts as a security element, but at the same time, on the other end, there is this sense of collectivity, the sense of entertainment, where the space is not being used. It's very hard to define all these things and trying to understand what is the correct terminology. And luckily I stumbled across a Richard Zinnett and he described two things. He said borders and boundaries. He described boundaries as th places where things end. For example, an edge of a table. And he described borders as where two boundaries meet. For example, the beach where you have one end of the water and the other end of the sand and how that line keeps changing and how the organized organisms keep interacting with each other. So to start my research about embassies and important buildings and security, it led me to three different cities, Brussels, the European capital, uh, Geneva, the United Nations headquarter, as well as the Hague, which is the headquarters for international law. Uh, to start off, I wanted to understand what makes a space collective. And by collective, I mean a space where people get together and share some form of activity. So throughout the city, I went around taking pictures and observing different sites. And from them, I picked nine sites that I felt gave value to my research. However, I'm going to just skim through it and not go through all of them. Um, so for each site, I took a picture. And then I drew that picture and I tried to understand the elements. And I feel that drawing is very important because when you take a picture, it takes a second. But while drawing, it takes you 10 minutes, maybe less, maybe more. But while drawing, you understand why each particular line or material is added. So for each side, there's a picture, there's an exonometric and a section. Further then, we take that element and we break it up and we try to understand why that particular man is sitting there. What makes it a collective space? And seeing it, it is a green space that is surrounded by buildings and urban fabric. A person is sitting, he's got a place to sit a node while his back is protected in a form of comfort. And in front of him, there's some sort of activity. So through this, we realize that there a couple of elements when stitched together from collectivity. I'm gonna skip through these ones uh, slowly. Um, in this particular element, in this picture, we realize that, okay, you have these high benches, but why is there no one sitting on them? And we realize that through that space, because of the vast scale, and the sense that the activity was ha having behind the person's seat, it gave a sense of uncomfort, which made the space unusable. Uh, here's the breakup. You have the, the two rows on both sides and the benches on the side. Um, here's another element. Um, this is very interesting. This temporary architecture or scaffolding was not meant to be a collective space, but because of the sense of shelter, 
and the size and location of these bars made it a perfect space for someone to sit outside and smoke. This particular man, the bars act, are at the right height for him to rest on. And it's quite fascinating how these certain items that are not meant, are meant for a different purpose somehow intend to attract collectivity. This is the breakup in the section you can see is the same height. And this happens in, in, in several other places. Um, here's another site. You can look down both streets and there's no one standing or sitting. But in this particular zone, under this scaffolding, you see a, a couple of people hanging out together. So you start to understand that just by having this shade above and this cozy space in a vast environment encourages people to hang around under it. Okay, so this, the conclusion of, this, of Brussels was basically what makes a space collective and how we can encourage people from getting together and using a certain space. In Geneva, um, the same activity was carried on. Nine sites were highlighted, each of them in the same way, and we tried to understand why people gather in certain ways. I'm still looking for how to break boundaries and form borders, but Geneva did not provide the solution for that. But instead, it provided the importance of fine details. In this particular example, this is the entrance to the museum. It's in between two land-filled areas, and this is a passage that enters through. This angular wall acts as a perfect element that allows this lady to sit wherever she wants along the axis that makes her comfortable. So it shows the importance of furniture and at the same time, her back is shielded. And there's a sense of activity that's happening in front of her. Um, another example. This is inside the museum. There's uh, these guys chose to sit at the edge of this large courtyard space because again, their back is towards a certain space and they're facing the entrance. Um, I'm gonna skip through all of this. Here's another interesting um, element. Here you have uh, these joggers that are running along a road. But the beauty of this is that the Genevan government provided a floor paint or a temporary type of sidewalk that keeps the level of the floor the same, but provides the runners with that sense of security that this particular space is theirs. At the same time, the high walls and the tunneled vision provides the runner with focus and makes it a very popular jogging area, even though it's a road. Um, another element that, was, uh, that I discovered was the importance of pools. Pools are certain items that pull people towards it. In this particular case, you have a peacock and this man has walked uh, to the end of the park just to feed this peacock. And it shows that not necessarily all the elements discussed before are needed to form a creative uh, collective space. Just a good enough pull will bring people towards it. Here's the plan. This is the particular site and it's in the middle of this large garden and the elements I discussed before are not present. It's just this singular peacock. Um, skip through this as well. Oh, so that is Geneva for you. So my third trip is the Hague, which is the home of international law. Here is where I started getting um, clues and ideas and answers on how to find or how um, we can break boundaries and, and, and see security in a completely different way. And the Dutch are very open-minded and have a very different way of looking at architecture. Right away, the first site I saw is the Palace of Peace. Here, what they've done is they've opened an opening within the wall and their landscape that gives you a direct view towards the palace. Along it, they've provided a bench for people to look towards. Here, instead of creating this as a zone where people cannot come, they've used it as a collective space. Furthermore, the line 
and the two spaces now no longer are boundaries, but are two is a border. They're bringing two spaces uh, together. Um, so this is the particular area and it, you can view straight into the palace. Um, I'm gonna skip all of these. Another fantastic example is a is this um, constitutional building of the government, which is very um, secured and, and it's impossible to get in. It's a very sensitive place, and they needed the security to pr protect their building. But what they've done is they've created a very large moat, a water body that acts as a wall, but at the same time, it's hidden, you can't see it. And here in this particular case, this suddenly becomes a, a, an attraction, a usable space, and the park across it suddenly has something to view. The, they've done these fine little details that uh, allow or make someone want to sit here. There's a road behind them, but what they've done is they've tapered the land slightly higher. So if someone is standing on the road, they actually look over this person. So suddenly a element that is meant to secure a certain space suddenly encourages collectivity and is hidden. And what we are trying to achieve can be seen here. Here's another example of another corner of that uh, moat. Uh, this particular bench is made much higher and thicker and shows that our previous research of collective elements that encourage uh, collectivity actually are correct and work. Um, yep, so that are the three I wanted to talk about each uh, one of the nine. So we're gonna start jumping into the design. So New York, uh, New York City, so that's our site. And um, this is our particular site. Uh, this is the United Nations building, you have the waterfront. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there are about eight small little puncture points that I chose where we look at how we can break certain uh, boundaries and how with small minute interventions, we can make a very large impact. Uh, the first site is, I'm, I'm sure now when we go into the examples, everything I'm trying to say starts making sense. Uh, here you have a pavement with large concrete blocks that are meant to prevent cars from ramming into this building. They've tried to make it look pretty by adding planters into them, but then again, the space becomes dead. It's this whole pavement that could add so much value to the streetscape around. So here's an elevation, um, this is an, it's a hotel. And we start looking at what we can do with it. What would happen if we, using our examples in Brussels, uh, cut these blocks in different shapes and by studying the human form and the way that we use a certain objects around us, create urban furniture. The mass remains the same and it still serves a purpose of preventing cars from ramming into the space. But at the same time, the street suddenly becomes usable for people to interact or uh, talk to each other, hang out, adding value to the street. Here's another example. Um, in, the, in New York, uh, they have a certain law building regulation where if you uh, give the ground footprint to the public, you're allowed to build higher. So it encourages people or builders to give public spaces on the ground. In this particular case, they've shown it with a different sense of element. And in our example in Geneva, you saw that the paint on the floor affects the way people use it. But even though it's meant for the public, the change in texture allow, uh, prevents people from using it. Suddenly it feels like a private space where you're not allowed to walk. And all the people who are walking are walking on the other pavement. So keeping that in mind um, that this space is meant for the public, what would happen if we change just the, the floor pattern and match it with the floor, add benches and suddenly this space starts becoming more welcoming. Uh, another image, another site is site number three. This is a bus stop. Here under the bridge, you can see 
large uh, cement blocks that the police uses this bridge to store it. Uh, however, when you look at the bridge, I mean, the, sorry, the bus stop, you see all these people are standing and waiting and you see this missed opportunity that when you have these elements at the back, just by rearranging them, you can create sitting spaces for them. And suddenly it adds value and breaks this boundary and forms a border. Um, here is a scaffolding space that is a temporary structure, but in New York, somehow they tend to be there forever. And in this picture, you notice that uh, even though it's relatively busy, they're all walking towards the right side of the pathway, giving the indication that the dark space on the left becomes very unwelcoming and people prefer walking towards the right. So it adds as an opportunity. This particular wall acts as a boundary that is a sense of end. What would we do if we remove the fence here, shorten the, the, the width of the scaffolding, suddenly we add light behind and the space transcends to a different volume, making it more usable. So this is the fifth site. Uh, it's a large green buffer that divides um, the footpath with the building itself. They've, I mean, I appreciate it being green and it looks pretty, but these large or very high uh, bushes act as a security deterrent where they're trying to push people back, making a, a buffer zone to, and ensuring their safety. But however, it's a missed opportunity. And when we look at the Dutch, we could do it slightly different. We could remove the green space and add a water body and create a small little park that adds value, forms collectivity and breaks the boundary. And the water of course acts as the same element as the grass and the bushes were because no one's gonna jump and swim across. So it serves as both purposes and suddenly with design, we're adding more value and making a very prime spot uh, more usable. Uh, this is inside the United Nations. We have uh, these barricades that are without any purpose. Um, the edge of the end is at a level with the grass, but as you go deeper down, the depth increases. These are redundant. And um, if we could rethink design, why can't it act as a space that adds the security, but also collectivity. So there are a few elements here. So you change the shape of it with orientation to the depth. So areas where the ground and the level of the floor are less, the mass is larger. And as you go further down, the depth increases. So the mass can be smaller. Um, okay, so here's another one. This is, uh, Again, we have these large New York blocks and no one using these benches. Um, so the idea was that to flip the orientation, um, keep the blocks where they are, add a slight bench towards them that act as a barrier and protection from the traffic while providing the park across as a view point. These are again elements all picked up from the research. Um, this is the last site, number eight. Um, here, I went through so many pictures and I noticed that everyone sitting on these benches just kept looking down. And I realized from this particular pitch that the, the railing right across act is hitting your exact eye level. And that's why people can't even see the, the, the river. And it's amazing how with small details like this makes such a big impact. So the most obvious solution is to either reduce the railing over a long side or increase the height of the bench by adding a little platform. So those were the um, various small minute interventions and that, that were all along the side, but I, I felt empty after doing all of these and I felt that there's still more to discover. So the challenge became that I'm talking about breaking boundaries and how do I achieve it by joining all these eight sites together in one uniform way. 
And the challenge arose that, okay, yes, but, but how they're so far apart, they're in different areas, how can we achieve it through drawings? And this is what I want to stress upon. Drawing is so important. And I feel in the nowadays, we are just, uh, we just focus on computers, 3Ds, renders, and we forget the art and craft of drawing. The beauty of drawing is that there are no limitations. It's just the paper. You can do whatever you want. So to, find, to sum it all up, I created a drawing that's 10 feet by three feet long that joins all eight sides together. Um, unfortunately, I can't fit it all in one slide, so we're gonna break it up in two. Uh, so this is the first site, and this is the New York street. So I'm just gonna go back. So we're gonna capture all these sites in one uniform drawing. So this is the particular site. This is that road that goes through. This is site number one, where we've shown in a form of perspective. And the perspective then bends and becomes the plan. Further on, as the street goes forward, the plan then turns into an elevation, showing you the building, the, the, the space below. And uh, yeah, and then you go further forward. Uh, again, this is an elevation. It converts into a plan. That's site number three. The bridge underneath is cut off uh, so that you can see through it. And this is the scaffolding on the right. Um, move next. So that's the other end where the scaffolding then becomes a perspective where you can view across site of, um, I forgot the name, the, the green area. And behind this building is this particular space, which is our next site. And it converts into a plan in the top. And that perspective then joins to site number eight, which is raised. Yep, thank you. I. That's about it. Um, yeah, thank you. I hope thank that you. makes sense. Thank you, Rafi, for sharing your research, beautiful drawings, and analysis of collective spaces. It was really very interesting. Thank you. I would like to now request our final uh, set of presenting designers, architects Shweta and Pranav, to please share their work. Thank you. I am going to share it now. Hi, so thank you, Fozia and Rafe. I'm, I'm really looking forward to our conversation after I'm done with this. Uh, and so I'm gonna quickly just get into what Studio Pomegranate does. Uh, we're Studio Pomegranate uh, run by Shweta and I, and uh, we've got four, five, six people on and off uh, over the years. Uh, we started in 2014. And uh, so it's been about six years now, uh, a little more than six years. And uh, we, we really started without um, any sort of boxing in or, uh, or deciding that this is, what, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. Uh, the idea really was to do the best of whatever we, we designed and uh, not not really slotting ourselves in into any sort of uh, silos uh, that this is the type of you know commercial work we're going to do or residential that that was kind of the uh, fashion at that time and people used to ask you that uh, we did not want to do any of those things um, so I'm going to talk today about one second uh, about really what inspires us. So we do we do a bunch of different projects all the way from urban design uh, to like architecture products little objects everything uh, we we despite doing all these types of typologies we try blurring the lines as much as possible and that's what I'm going to talk about today um, so in our whole body of work uh, we we have the urban scale. Uh, an architectural scale of uh, you know, buildings and such, um, and all the way going down, all the way to the object scale, micro uh, object products, uh, that kind of a thing. Um, 
And uh, so the first project I'm going to show you all is uh, at the urban scale, which is the Mumbai Mile pedestrian infrastructure. Uh, this was a space under a bridge at Lower Parel, which is in the middle of Mumbai. And uh, this space was being used to, to just like throw garbage, to park cars. People used to go and pee at the end of it. Uh, on weekends, uh, kids used to come and play cricket inside because the cars wouldn't be parked. Uh, but we we were asked by some of the residents out there, and some of, and we are also a part of that because our our studio is right outside here. Um, and we were asked by them to help change this place and make it a public a, a lively public space. So uh, we we started looking at the project and started looking at what was there. Uh, there was basically only illegal parking under the bridge uh, with two roads on two sides and, uh, of course, a road on top. Um, there was a U-turn in between where people would cross and uh, there there was this like little uh, friction point because cars would be turning, people would be walking inside that. It was just, it was just one big mess in this place. Uh, so we decided, okay, if we move the U-turn and make some more space for for these cars to to kind of turn around and do their thing. Then we also provide more space for pedestrians to cross, not just that one little location, which is in between cars. Uh, and then reduce that thing in the front so that cars can gather at the signal and, and go out and, you know, they, and, and leave uh, pedestrian space uh, on it by itself. Then streamlining everything and adding some utilities. So the purple thing is uh, toilets for uh, handicapped and uh, everyone and uh, other utilities for the space, water, electricity and such. The space in between then um, became, gave us a lot more space. So we added some taxi base so that public transport, uh, so that shared public transport like taxis can be accessed from here from a safe uh, spot. Overall, the whole thing added to the the uh, pedestrian infrastructure in the space, and you had an added uh, amount of footpath in that location. So, quickly showing you images of what it was like before and what it is like now. There's benches; they're all in the shade, and taxis can go right. Now. There's no taxis in this, but I'll show you some images ahead. There's benches on the left. These benches are uh, not just barricades that, uh, they're, they're not just benches to sit on, they're also barricades so that if cars any or a truck or something crashes into it, it buffers the person who's sitting behind and uh, you know probably hopefully doesn't uh, injure anyone in the process. Using local plants, now, the whole effect of this project has been that so many people are using it every day and for different things um, that, that we've been able to, with this project, we've been able to demonstrate that public space is important. Now, I know that for, for everyone here, it's something that's like a given, but uh, for, for sometimes for government officials, we have to really explain them that you need public space, you need that free space for people to come 24 hours. Um, and this was an event. This is uh, kids from the neighborhood coming in here, playing, doing parker, uh, playing musical instruments. They, just, they just do everything. Uh, the taxi union was very happy because they got a safe space to come in, park their cars and wait for customers instead of being harrowed on the streets by policemen. Um, so now they're there and uh, this is how uh, the shared taxis are being used every day. Uh, during the lockdown, the space was being used as a space to, to distribute food. And uh, it was really nice because otherwise there would be no place in this entire neighborhood. Uh, we've been trying our best to get this message out to public authorities, to the police, to the, you know, the ministers everybody trying to get them to understand that this is what you need. You need free open public space. There are a lot of gardens in, in Mumbai, but they are not open. They usually close at 7 p.m. And that is not very helpful. Finally, uh, one night, this was 2 a.m. 
we found these boys dancing under the bridge and when we asked them how old they were and where they came from they're about 13 to 15 years old and they come from very far away they come from like almost 15 16 kilometers away to dance under a bridge at midnight so we asked them why do you do that and that's because there is no free open public space where they live and this is the only time they can come and do it peacefully so that really made us think how can we help more of these people in using more space and demanding more space so we started this initiative called design crowd uh where uh, one can identify users uh, have a conversation with them so that's all the research part uh help people understand and be aware of what their rights are as as citizens of india and uh help them also help with the design and innovation so that they can they can go to their elected leaders and tell them that this is what we want and that in turn empowers and engages them to to be to be citizens and and be uh, hold their uh, leaders responsible um so this project was really about uh, the fact that we can all design our world the next project i'm going to show is uh, from the, for the rural scale and also works on the same kind of principle of we can all design our world um here's a house uh, this is the fa a farmer's house in kamshed uh this is the view from that house is a beautiful beautiful view um but unfortunately because of building costs they were living in squalor and it it wasn't really nice but what you can see in this is that everything is very neatly arranged and everything is clean they just don't have enough money to build the house so we said okay like what what do you do they they make this uh, they use thatch and they and they use reeds which they tie together and make walls uh the farmer had built this uh, boom barrier for himself after seeing what happens on our highways and built this boom barrier which works on one double a battery and a remote that he found in mumbai so you you know if you if you drive up he very proudly comes and like turns it on with his remote and it opens and you can go in so everyone is quite ingenious despite not being too well educated or in this case not educated at all um so we we thought that what what can we do that would be a bare minimum and allows them uh to to build more on top of it so this is the idea a half a good house so you have half the walls uh built you have windows doors all of that and then the person who's going to live there puts in a lightweight roof it may be a metal roof it may be a thatch roof it could be anything something that they know how to build uh and a window or a breathing wall or anything really this plan can change it it doesn't have to be like this this was made in conjunction with the farmer service of collaboration uh and here you go there's there's only one l shape wall small walls in between that that close in close in the bedroom and the kitchen the uh, the bathroom is open on the side and the what, what we would call a living room but is basically only a big veranda is open and is enclosed by a net so some sketches of how how that was evolving when uh, while discussing with them and uh, you know finally like putting it all together this is what it turned out like you can see that he's enclosed the bathroom because he was obviously didn't didn't want uh, anyone to look in and then he also enclosed the the roof which i was suggesting not to it would have become cheaper if it if it was not closed uh agronet is something that farmers use all the time it is extremely cheap uh and uh, they've used it to cover their front veranda this is a family uh they live there uh the wife put all her utensils together very neatly and i really loved how she had done it because it felt like she uh, took ownership of the house as soon as it was complete um this is what that veranda looks like now and uh, looking out at the view they've got a completely open seamless view the the bedroom is a small space with a window 
and here's the bathroom. It's got a little tank at the back which heats up water by solar light and uh, then pours it into that uh, bucket there. So you get like lukewarm water every day and then you can heat it further by by burning the agricultural waste under it, very little amount uh, in that. Okay. Um, the next project I'm going to show you all is the uh, ladies common room in the KEM hospital. So KEM hospital is a big public hospital in the middle of Mumbai. And uh, it, it also has a medical college attached to it. And this college is, is a beautiful, beautiful, I mean, it's a beautiful building. It's got beautiful details inside. It's got really nice spaces, really comfortable. Uh, they're, they're really meant for medical students. And uh, this is our room that we were looking at. Um, and this is what it looked like when we got there. It, it was a bit difficult to use because they had like 10 times as many medical students as they used to, not 10 times, maybe yeah, twice as many medical students as they used to have before. Uh, but over the day, it gets really crowded and sometimes there isn't enough space. So the girls sit on the bench, on the desk, or they don't come here all together and they like sit outside in the garden or something. Uh, but all throughout the day it is being used. Lighting isn't great. So uh, it's, it's a bit hard for them to study. Uh, there isn't enough space. There aren't enough resting spaces. So there isn't enough space for people to lie down. Um, so we, we started looking into what we could do with this space. And uh, we decided let's pull in a mezzanine. Um, so we started building this steel mezzanine in that space. We put in a foundation, built the steel mezzanine. Uh, it was, it is to be, it is a, uh, an unconnected structure. So it stands inside the building like a piece of furniture. It's covered, uh, it's got a marble uh, floor on top, which lets the light in through it because then it, it's also reduced the size of the, the volume uh, that you get under that. Um, and then we built a really, nice staircase that climbs up to there. Uh, in all of this, we always uh, end up having a lot of fun. So, with, uh, you know, making these fun videos and uh, putting, putting these things together. Here you can see the light that comes in through the marble above. And uh, what really drove the staircase and many other objects that we have put in through through this, that there was there was a, a, some kind of system or typology set up already in the building that we simply went, studied, and uh, replicated to make this uh, to make this space. The whole the whole space was made quite scientifically. We tested it rigorously, like this, uh, and and we made everything much simpler and much easier to use. Uh, we replicated all the hardware that was missing, built it again with brass in the same format that it was made, and just refurbished the space to make it new and shiny and good for the next 50 years at least. So here's some quick images of what it was like before and what it looks like now with lighting, with space to sit, fans. There are, there are beds on top of this uh, mezzanine now. Or oh, you can see the beds in this image. And uh, lockers for the girls to keep their books and uh, stethoscopes, etc. cetera. Uh, the side rooms uh, that, that were being used, how they're being used now, they get running water, they get uh, uh, RO filtered water to drink to fill their bottles, changing rooms. Uh, the toilets have also been converted into better toilets with uh, with nicer tiles, um, and and you can see that these tiles are curved at the edges so that no no g dirt or grime anything gets stuck, um, and a new agency has come in to clean everything and uh, keep everything nicer. And finally, this is how it's being used now. Okay, the next one uh, is what what do we see as in, is as inspiration is what I started with, and everyone all these projects that I showed until now 
uh, had had a context that was uh, environmental. It was around us, and uh, we had to sort of. Uh, it, it was pretty clear. Um, with this, it's a bar, and the only concept that we went with were, was alcohol. So how do you how do you translate alcohol into a concept for the interior of a bar? Um, so these are botanical illustrations of uh, hops and barley, with which we would make beer. And uh, the drawing on the right is a drawing of putting these images down as nature patterns. Nature patterns is something that Frank Lloyd Wright used to practice, and uh, putting them down as nature patterns and making them into into forms to to make the interior of the space. Now, those nature patterns were not just used as decoration; it was also used to explain a process. So, for example, in this image, you can see that it's water and barley being mixed with heat, uh, adding hops to it, creating the beer. And the brewery is right behind it, so you can read into the brewing process of beer when you see this uh, image, this imagery in the front. Um, obviously, like all our projects, the details and everything were were set in. You can see that there are coasters made of brass built into the uh, the table. Um, so overall, we were we were getting a bit we're getting a bit fancier now, um, and I think that's. That's also something that we've been working on to make sure that we're not slotted into any particular um, economic uh, section of architecture. We're doing every kind of work that is possible. Um, so finally, I'm coming, not finally, this is the last, second last to last one, uh, is the object scale, where uh, if you don't even have a con context and you don't have environment, you don't know what you're doing. So how do you put, uh, something together. So we came up with these tables, uh, which are thin aluminum tables. They are they weigh between 1.3 kilo and 1.7 kilo, and uh, they're very very light. They're easy to carry around. They're beautiful colored, and they 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 get put together uh, with uh, with a set of screws, and uh, you can you can basically stack them and uh, hide them. Uh, for storage. So in storage, it's a small box as big as like a large book. And uh, otherwise, in your uh, room, it it can be used. It's, they're pretty strong. And uh, it, it's part of the next project that it, it's, it sort of came out of the next project that we're going to talk about, um, which is the Andaman project. Now, here, we're looking at uh, uh, the Andaman where we're building a resort. Uh, and and if you, when you think of the Andaman Island, you mostly think of the sea and water and you know blue skies, clouds, uh, more sea, more water, a little bit of mangroves maybe or something like that. Uh, but there really is like an inner ring to this and that is the trees. The trees are perhaps the most beautiful part of the Andaman Islands actually. And uh, we we really wanted to use these trees as uh, as inspiration for what we would do. Um, here's some trees with rocks. These rocks are also something that you will not find anywhere else. They're a quartzitic green stone, and it's really beautiful. There isn't much of it. Uh, there isn't much uh, built heritage either on the Andaman Islands, and uh, mostly you'll find structures like this, which were Japanese bunkers built during the World War. Um, there is a uh, wood, which is uh, freely, not freely, quite widely available. It's called padak. It's a deep red wood and it's beautiful. It's got a beautiful color. It's been grown by the Andaman administration on the island itself. So it's local and it grows quickly. It's like teak wood, it's strong and uh, it works really well. Uh, the the trees uh, that I was talking about earlier are just are just amazing. Like this is a tree that has a whole room in its roots. You can stand in there and spend a whole day just like looking outside and observing nature. As it gets older, it grows this patina on it uh, that that is bet, you know better than a painting. So really, these trees were what inspired us to to research more about the island 
we couldn't find any books on the trees of the andaman so we set out like actually walking across the forest and and writing down the names of trees that we could find with locals with forest officials with anyone who would help us with what the characteristics of these trees were um and and it it was quite an adventure um so we finally kind of came to a, a, a an idea of what the trees of the andaman islands are like uh there was still more study to happen with the with the plants and shrubs but finally we've come to a book which is about a 700 page book and uh, it it has a page on on every tree and what it does of course we keep making notes in it and we keep adding trees and plants to it uh we're doing this uh, yeah i mean this will be a work in progress i suppose through the, throughout the life of this project uh and this is one of the illustrations from the book uh which is how each type of forest in the andaman islands meets with each other so you have the the tropical rainforest on the left uh which then gets to a little bit of cultivable land which people have used so you have some cultivation happening in that you have some uh marshy areas uh, or wet areas swamp lands all of that you have some plains and then you have bamboo forests and finally uh finally going down to the mangroves now what we really wanted to do was to use this ecology as the architecture we don't really want to build much over here what what we will build will be like like furniture inside this space so the canopy of the trees is the roof of our building and the walls and the and the foliage around it are the walls of our building uh so it it truly is a wild place and we really want to keep it that way keep it wild uh and and so we the way we see our buildings uh in in this landscape are is is a sort of fence uh we are we are at the cusp of uh, humanity and and just complete nature without uh, devoid of humanity so uh we've made these these entry houses to the property and they are double doors so you you walk in from one door you come to a clearing in the forest and then you walk out through another door to to go to you know your room to the restaurant or whatever you're going to go to uh these jungle circles will be used for all kinds of things gathering so uh we really expect a community gathering sort of situation happening around the jungle circles uh here's a sketch of uh what that would look like it's a circle and you can see the whole resort at the back the tree is not fully grown um so to start with we we were trying to figure out how to build these structures of the jungle circle and uh, we were looking at how the local tribesmen build things and they don't really build anything they use thatch and they they make little tents uh so the image on the right is not of the andaman islands it's from sri lanka and uh, it's sort of a a growth of what the andaman islanders do because we can't just have tents um so we we've put we we're using this typology to help the locals who live there to to build better so they will keep they will be constantly building these structures on our property uh constantly re removing things as they get old and as they decay and putting in new plant uh building that come up and uh through this whole process they will learn and through this process we will also learn what works and what doesn't work as natural building so it's it's sort of this natural building with local and it will go on to infinity as we uh, as so we assume so this is the first prototype that we've already built this was last year actually so it's uh, it's already survived a whole monsoon uh so next year we'll come and build another one this is the site and uh it's it's exactly that sketch that i'd showed you all earlier with the rainforest on the left uh, a swamp and uh, land in between some of that land was used for agriculture earlier and then you've got the bamboo forest and the mangrove forest on the right towards the sea 
we have already started planting trees on this site and we are hoping that we'll have a, a growing rainforest in this. We, we're really being very careful with how we're planting them. We don't want to plant the wrong trees in the wrong place. Uh, this is a, another entry and this is sort of a way to see what you would see when you enter from the road and uh, what what you would see, uh, how, what the view is when, when you enter the property if you came in from the road. We have arranged all of these buildings uh, which seem haphazard uh, or not in order, but there's a mountain on the left uh, where the legend is written. And uh, all of these are sort of looking at the mountain. And on the other hand, they're also uh, in the shade of the trees, they're in the shade of canopies, or they're getting cut for the trees. Uh, so the building is getting cut for trees and, and it opens up uh, to, to the space. On the left on top, there's a hill. And uh, at the end of this, I'll show you what we're doing on top of the hill. This is how we place our buildings on site. So the, the, site, that, the site plan that I showed you earlier is, is how you is how we placed it like this. And uh, we built these bamboo structures which are carried by four men. And uh, then we go and place them on site and we, we take our chairs and go and sit inside and imagine what it would be like to have a room in this place or have a bathroom in that place or to have, you know, a bunch of rooms. Um, so we're, we're, we're using this sort of experiential process to design this, pro this project. And uh, finally, what it's going to look like is something, um, something like in between the race Margos fort in Goa or uh, uh, and, and a Meghalayan village uh, for uh, the communal spaces that it has got outside it. Uh, a quick image of uh, you know what what the structures would look like. It it we're we're borrowing something from the Japanese shelter, uh, Japanese bunkers. And uh, so here's the rooms with a, with a larger room on the left and a slightly smaller room on the right. Um, and they have, the, the, the main room is basically a, a bedroom and living kind of suite space with a walk-in wardrobe on the right and a large bathroom that opens up into a plunge pool. All of these spaces open up into the landscape and they have walls around it. The right room is just a slightly smaller version of the left side room and does exactly the same thing, but doesn't have that little plunge pool. Uh, so that's that's the spatial planning that we've done where you have private space inside. You have semi, uh, semi public space that's outside and is bounded in by these walls. And then you have free open space that is privately yours uh, when you're in this room, but it opens up to the surroundings. Uh, again, the size of the size and scale of the buildings uh, are meant to make it feel like furniture. You will literally sit on these buildings, and uh, you'd be under the trees that are that large. Uh, we've we love making models at the studio, and we made models of this project with concrete, which is a real material that we'd be using. Uh, so we cast them in concrete. Uh, there's a studio called Material and Material who helped us a lot with how to do it. Uh, we have had a lot of fun with laying those walls that I explained about before. How do you how do you play with the space in the wall? We've had a lot of fun making the models because we're making these tiny little objects with with uh, with wood, with the same padak wood that we're going to be using to build the project and the same concrete that we're going to be using to cast the walls. And uh, that's what our models look like. We're, we're using them for all kinds of things from to understand the space, to understand how they go together and uh, also like how, how um, they're, they're configured. The, the section is very simple. It's got a copper roof um, and that slopes down like that. It's a, it's a uh, shaded room. It's dark and it opens up to that view that I explained before. The bathroom is like this. It feels like an open space. It's got plants inside it. It's got plants outside it. It's got openings in the sky so that you've got skylights. You've got a, uh, the other bathroom even has a large courtyard inside it. 
and uh, here's the copper roof. Uh, finally, we want the building to kind of merge into its surrounding, like the Japanese shelter, the Japanese bunker has done, and uh, and just be the smallest object that it could be. Uh, I'm slowly going to start going towards the water, and uh, for which I'm going to show you what rain looks like. In the So it it really when it rains it really comes down really really hard. The videos were shot completely apart, so you can you can see how much of a difference a little bit of rain has made for uh, the Andaman Islands. So to to kind of use this rain, uh, we wanted to build a pavilion which would also serve as a restaurant and uh, a chill space, uh, and this pavilion has. Openings in this in this roof, which let the rain in. We want the rain to come down. We want it to come down like a sheet of water, and and to and one moment you're looking across this room where you can see this this structure on the other side, uh, and another moment you're not able to see anything on the other side because the rain is so strong. Uh, the the atmosphere of the space really is uh, a pavilion in the forest. Uh, but but in in a in a slightly in a slightly different uh, uh, colonial sort of almost colonial kind of way like the Raffles Hotel in Singapore or uh, or or this structure which is just like a wood lattice work uh, but but put together uh, here's here's that room uh, on the left is the restaurant which has an open um, live kitchen and on the right is a forest of columns which hold Holds up that chill space and keeps you dry when you're on top, closer to the roof. At the back is the kitchen, and then on the bottom is a bar which uh, encloses itself. So this bar doesn't really open up to anything. It's not like a normal tr tropical bar. It's like a cave. It wants you to come inside and be away from everything outside uh, for a for a change in the space. Um, so that's the space with the restaurant and a veranda outside and the chill space and a veranda outside. Uh, materially, we're doing the same as everything else with, with wood and concrete. That's what it would look like. And again, playing with the models of how, how the whole space is put together. Uh, finally, coming to the sea. Uh, in the Andaman Islands, the, the sea is something you cannot ignore. And, uh, you, you kind of go through it, seeing it. And I wanted to put it last because um, obviously it's the most important part, but uh, water and the uh, with how you would experience the sea. underwater there's a whole world out there that you don't really see when you're on the surface and this is something we wanted to capture in in our space uh, sorry the video is a bit shaky but uh, it's been shot by swimming around with my phone It's a beautiful, beautiful space. These, these reefs are reefs that died in the 2004 tsunami and they have come back to life. So I specifically show you uh, something uh, on purpose. It's, it's not a beautiful, uh, you know, Maldives reef yet, but it will be there.
so really what happens is if you get in if you want to get into the water anywhere and you're a new dean it it probably is a bit overwhelming and uh, you don't you you can't imagine this these are 25 foot waves while we're sitting on a little raft like boat uh, going going into the sea it, it it's quite scary so we wanted to we wanted to kind of make uh, something in in the space uh, that would prime you for this water and for the experience under the water and yet kind of give you a much more civilized way to do it um this is the site and the sun setting at our site once the sun sets uh the sky presents something to you there's always these like beautiful things that the andaman islands present and unlike so many other tropical places there's very little light pollution so you can see the milky way and it's amazing so what we did was we used uh we used this we used the the stars in the milky way and we plotted them down onto our pool layer so as to make the lighting layout for the pool uh and and we put we put the light scattered all over the landscape as well uh here's the pool it's a it's 150 feet long so it's quite long and it has uh three pools in it so they make that topography that i was talking about earlier uh underwater that you experience uh they they also have uh it's it's not exactly of a finished surface it's made of stone so it's a natural uh, natural looking pool but from the outside like the sea it's a calm flat piece of water and uh, it's a flat uh, body of water that sits in this landscape again like every other structure on the site it's it's only um, it's on, it's only that small in in relationship to its surroundings and the trees finally that lo- large plot that we had we're building some bigger rooms there for uh, for uh, guests and uh, making a kind of a, a a viewing deck for people to see we calling it the jungle gym and uh, this is a model that we made so that the clients and us can all sit at a studio and play with it it's it's like a little game uh, they they made with 3d printed uh, stairs and brass rods that come up and you can pull them out and reconfigure all the stairs the way you like to make uh, whatever you want to make uh because we want this project really to be a a a project of its surroundings and of its environment so we want you to experience the environment to to its fullest um uh, and uh, this this structure will really help with doing that uh it's got it's got this little thing coming up and uh, plenty of spaces with different types of activities from morning till evening to to do all these things uh finally here's our collection of uh shells corals uh on the from found on the beach and and other natural objects that that we have found there uh we are going to be returning these at the end of the project to their respective beaches uh and they they are at andaman right now so we haven't brought them to mumbai or something um uh, with that uh yeah that is the end of uh what we are talking about at super bond grand thank you so much pranav and shweta for sharing your wonderful work with us uh such diversity and uh the act of actually uh blending boundaries between urban um to private to now wellness so just wonderfully inspiring thank you so much for sharing your work with us with this we now open out the session for conversation i would like to introduce and welcome our moderators for the conversation architect chanar uh, balsaraf from mumbai he graduated from ies college of architecture mumbai in 2018 and has studied indian art and aesthetic at gnana parva uh, mumbai he is currently working at snk mumbai and has been associated at hekar foundation as a research associate uh, 
He is deeply interested in architectural research and cultural landscape. We also welcome our second moderator for today, architecture student Nikita Sunil Valikard. She's a final year architecture student from ASADI Cochin, India. She is a contributor to the Indian magazine A Plus D. Nikita is passionate about understanding people through the environment and the systems. Nikita is also part of our DU conference team for the very first DU conference. Welcome to Chanar and Nikita. With this, we thank our speakers for their fabulous presentations and open the session for conversation. We invite the audience to please type in audience questions. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers uh, for the insightful presentation. Um, the conversation is divided into two parts. We have a few uh, questions to all of the speakers and then few uh, individual questions to each of the speakers. So my first question is to everyone. Like each one of your practice is a young practice yet to complete a decade. What were the initial challenges and how do you envisage the way forward? What are the issues and concerns you would like to address in your practice? Um, architect Fozia, we can start with you. Um, I think to answer that question, um, I think a big part of it is um, to earn respect. Um, I think it's a big challenge um, because um, once you have your own practice, you really don't have anyone else to count on but yourself. And I think to pave the way, uh, to pave the way forward, um, I guess we have to meet the right people who can see our potential, and um, who see who's willing to see eye to eye, uh, regardless that we're young or how old we are. And um, also through our practice, um, I think the thing we want to address is that um, it's a big world out there for architects and there's I think there's a, a cake for everyone um, there's no right and wrong path in architecture you can just start doing your own thing as soon as as soon as you graduate school or you want to work for someone for 10 years like both are fine you can work on like um, urban projects or focusing on sustainable material issues social work or like only doing luxury villas or even everything or like even doing everything at the same time. Um, so I think um, that's the thing we want to address. Thank you. Thank you, Architect Fodia. Uh, Architect Rafa. I, I, I am sorry I didn't hear the question properly. Uh, so as a young practice, how uh, do you envisage, uh, what were your initial challenges and how do you envisage the way forward? What are your, the issues and concerns uh, you would like to address in your practice? Uh, I'm still a very young practice. Uh, I don't think I've gone out of the deep waters yet. Um, issues is, I think, confidence. I think... Um, the biggest challenge that I face is, can you manage or can you do it? Can you make your firm uh, sustainable? I think that for me is a, is a challenge uh, looking at the financial um, uh, side of it because it's a risk uh, to set up something new and how do you manage uh, to survive or how do you manage to build your name? I think that's the challenge I'm facing right now. And uh, confidence is always... Uh, <laughs> There, then, what if uh, you make mistakes, or how do you learn from mistakes? So that's that's about it. Thank you, architect Prana and architect Shweta. Hi, I think the biggest challenge for us was, um, like Fozia said, getting the respect because we would get clients often who would just say, like, "Why are you charging us so much? You're just going to print out one thing and give me." So, you know, it's, I'm not good. Um, why are you charging me so much? You know, your, what are your liabilities anyway? You know, you just want a laptop and a printer and you're sorted. So just riding the wave, I would say, like, you know, going through those clients as well as, you know, like taking your work seriously because now it's, you know, you're just going to pay for everything and it's just you. So just finding the right balance in terms of uh, 
kind of work that you want to do, like what your ethos are, and um, yeah, just uh, you know, doing the right kind of work even in the hardest of the times. Yeah, you know, I think we've uh, challenges. Challenges are only momentary, actually, because if you feel that your whole, you know, your whole year or whole life has been a challenge, you're in you're in the wrong place. So uh, those those things are just a momentary thing that that you're like, oh, that was a that was a niggle. That was that was something that we didn't like. But other than that, we've had a lot of fun in whatever we've done, and I think that's the most important thing that we have to look at it. Uh, look at it in in the way of having fun and and enjoying yourself as as the practice. Uh, in terms of what we want to address, really, like at least for the last year or so, or more than that, we've been trying to um, trying to get more public opinion and more uh, more public awareness through our projects and by meeting people, by uh, by showing how things can improve uh, with public. Uh, attention you know when they ask for uh, ask for it so we're we're really trying hard to make that happen now uh, because i think that all the other private projects you know resorts bars restaurants they those are going to keep happening and those are going to be fairly easy uh, the 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 whole climate outside with uh, with even with what rafi was saying it's it's all around the world that we are finding things more walled in and we don't need those walls yeah. also i would like to add that through the years we've also uh, sort of educated the client in terms of uh, you know the gap that's between design and build that's one of the premise that we started our studio with so we involve them as much into the whole uh, the knowledge and the know how of how something will be built and also just educating them in terms of you know that don't go after just because it's trendy or it's in fashion or it's just you know modern looking stuff we have our contacts have indian sensibilities in them so we need to follow that through and we have been successful to a very uh, large extent in these years in just educating the client uh, and you know getting them to understand why we do and design something so yeah thank you thank you akita pranav and shweta yeah nikita will uh, moderate the next question yeah so firstly thank you to all of you for the wonderful presentation that was like wonderful in different ways and so yeah so like what were your inspirations or the initial mentors or ideals you had like while starting a practice or thinking about starting one like so to this to all of you so maybe we can start with fazia um i think um for me if if like if the question is about like who inspires me and who influenced um i think mostly are my past employers um in a way like so i i work for a different um like several different people before i started the practice um and i think every one of them um gives like a different um influence and inspiration like um i worked the longest for uh andre martin and i really adore him for him uh, for his gifted um like design talent and his very kind heart and uh, during undergrad i worked for um abi from algo architects who showed me like how to really value employers work um and also to uh like value time and i also uh like during my time in the us i i also interned like here and there i work for like a faculty in michigan um eli abrams who i think he really showed me like that you can be a mother with like two kids and still be doing awesome work and also i um i did a brief time in moss um in new york and i and i really love their like meticulous approach in like studio culture and then like their uh quirky branding and uh the last person i work for is um christian wasman in new york and i think what i really um get from him is that um he's really hands on and like he is really like he really 
shows like intense love and passion for everything he does. So I kind of um, like uh, get every like energy from every um, people I work with before. And, um, and also apart from what I, um, I experienced because so in FAR I have two other um, partners. So it's not only about me, but I also look into the works of their previous employers as well, because we never work in the same office, but I try to like um, understand what, what their inspirations are too. So I really um, try to get to know their past employers as well. So it's like a mix of everything for me. All right, thank you, Fazia. So now we'll hear from Rafi. Um, who inspires me? For me, it's a bit slightly different. Uh, I think the most important thing are teachers. And I had this one teacher who told me I was not meant to be an architect. So I think that was my biggest inspiration, uh, her telling me that I can't do it. And it just pushed me that to prove her wrong. So that was my biggest or still is driving force that um, to prove to her that I can be an architect. And for us, what, what is an architect? And an architect is basically when you achieve something or you actually make a difference. So I'm still striving for that. And um, hopefully one, once when I do, I can send it to her. Otherwise, the general inspirations every day, people who see you, who you, the work you see, I think people should just be observant and travel and just understand what people do and why they do it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm sure you're doing some great thing and you're having more to do. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Now, yeah, to architect Shweta and Prana. I think everything inspires me, like uh, nature, music, visiting, traveling, visiting ancestral properties, especially, you know, where people haven't been, some things that are run down, and just learning from the past more than, you know, what's going to happen or, you know, worrying about that. And also, uh, like, people who we worked with, you know, I interned at Studio Mumbai, and there was this architect, Bijoy Jain, who was looking into everything so meticulously. I learned about making beautiful drawings there. Each or everything had to be measured on site and then, you know, come back to the studio and draw it up. After that, I worked, I mean, I just wanted to test water. So I worked in, I worked at the studio. Then I tried working at a mid-sized firm. Then I worked at like a corporate, you know, like a big builder's office. And I was like, I don't like any of that. I liked where I interned, you know, and that's what, you know, my studio should also be, you know. So, yeah, my inspiration is all of this. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I I used to work at Studio Mumbai too, uh, so uh, obviously that became a big learning part for me. Uh, but then I was I also studied at Taliesin, uh, so Frank Lloyd Wright's ideology and uh, you know a lot a lot of what he taught the world is is there and and it kind of exists with a lot of people even now because uh, it's very important learning from nature and all of those things. Uh, besides that, I think uh, the single biggest building that has had an influence is the Kailashna Temple in Elora. And uh, I saw that uh, almost like 13, 14 years ago, probably. Uh, and that was the only time I saw it. But I'm telling you, like, you will learn a lifetime's worth of architecture if you go there for a day. So it is, it is the best place in the world to learn about scale, form, so many things. And you can just go there, take some lunch, and spend spend like a whole day there, uh, learning learning from that building. All right, it was really nice to hear from both of you. Over to Chennar again. So my question is to Studio Pomegranate. Uh, your practice is a multidisciplinary practice, from private residence, interiors uh, to urban intervention. Is it a deliberate attempt you have tried to infuse in your practice, or how did the journey begin? Would you like to share some thoughts on it? We, we started, uh, we, we built, someone asked us once if we'd design a footpath. So we said yes, and we'll design. You know, so it was like, 
<laughs> we'll just do everything, but we'll do it to the best of our abilities. And we we're not going to say no because it's a certain type of project. We'll say no for other reasons, but uh, not because it's a certain type of project. Yeah. Also, with that footpath project, it was so funny because it was like almost like a joke that they asked us. You know, they're like, uh, "Would you, you know, do architects design footpaths?" And I was like, "Architects can design everything." And we saw that as an opportunity to open up public spaces as a conversation within normal people. You know, why something makes, uh, why certain spaces become better and more usable, like how we saw in Rafay's uh, research as well. Yeah. So you know. a lot of impact has been created when you show people a before and after you know a transformation of a space and then people are mindful and then they're questioning their local authorities and you know the dialogue kept on going on and then you know the underfly over happened and we did a lot other urban projects which were not shown here but also that one project just gave us the confidence that you know we can design everything to the best of our abilities and the scale doesn't matter So that is why you yeah, can well, call it a deliberate attempt, but we we can design everything you know that comes our way. So yeah, no matter the scale. It was it was a footpath. It it got designed and built in like a, in less than a year, and then uh, it it was suddenly in all the national newspapers and everything. So it 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 was so surprising that you know a, a whole country doesn't doesn't have a single designed footpath. and it, it was scary at, as well so we kind of kept working in that uh, direction and we kept working in every other direction that we found so now we are now you can see what we are at we are like with all kinds of projects at once yeah i think it's important to blur that boundaries and working in silos we kind of architects tend to be like urban designers landscape architects architects and I think the greatest example you give is FLW, where he literally touched on each of these things and tried to infuse these ideas of architecture as an art. So that is a very important. Well, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright, like when when he always said that you should not be a specialist, you should mm -hmm. be a generalist. And mm -hmm. uh, he he used to tell people that if you come to Taliesin and you don't become an architect, you can become one of nine things. Or more than nine things. Like you can be a plumber, you can be an electrician. It was like that. You know, it was, it was really trying to tell people that you don't have to learn something with uh, with narrow focus. Narrow. Yeah. Thank you. Over to Nikita. So this too far. Uh, so, do you like find larger happiness and creativity like at work while collaborating as a young term a team? and are all your thoughts and and uh, you know ideas driven by this youth energy or are there any other critical influences in your practice um i think um i think like day by day at work um apart from the three of us we we um we are lucky to have like a really great team uh, with us at the studio So I think apart from the three of us, our team of staffs are also gives a lot of life and, as you said, like the young energy in the studio because like they're way younger than us. So like in a way, they have more energy uh, than than the three of us. Um, and um, I think we we learn a lot from them as well as much as maybe they think they learn something from us. Um, and sometimes you know with the age gap um maybe like the internet algorithm like catches us differently so we kind of sometimes we have like different information to share and we have like many conversations um in the studio about like um what they know and then what we know and then we just kind of like exchange and then think of the things we can do together and i think this is where um i think like the the like having a student environment that um and the culture with like a two way respect and two way um communication comes in handy so um i think i re like for this question i really want to like give credit to like the whole team in the studio for um always like um like giving that energy for all of us all right Yeah, so over to Chennar again. 
my question is to Rafael, architect Rafael. Uh, your work and research is intersection between architecture and urban design. What is your approach to architecture? Do you think it is important to blur the line between architecture and urban design? Or do you think we should stop working in silos? I mean, for this particular project uh, yeah. that I shared, it was a merger of both. But yeah. I feel like this answer has already been answered by yeah. from, uh, them earlier. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with what they said earlier that um, it's about design. The scale really doesn't matter. The rules apply, the same rules apply to each different type of scale. It's the way you approach it. And I just think we should look more into a problem that for me to how to design is to the architecture to solve a problem. And we should look more into research before diving into the solution. Yeah, so we should work you know, in a very uniform way. Thank you. Thank you, Architect Rafael. Nikita? All right, this to Pomegranate again. So like having done projects and collaborations of higher relevance to the general public and the common people, like you have a lot of humanitarian touch and study and research and almost everything you've worked upon. So do you find your projects or thoughts like future proof for a pandemic environment? Um, I think I think we we need not really think about the pandemic environment as as sort of a, a break point. It, it is a break point, but it it's something that we have created over a very long time. So it it has created it has been created because of this use and throw culture and 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 you know polluting and so many so many different things that we've been doing that have not been good for the planet. Now. Uh, when when we build something we really should not be thinking about it in with with this idea of a lifetime uh you know when when you say that oh i'm building this building for 20 years like really like the pyramids were built and then we we're coming here and we're seeing them after 8000 years and what what are you talking about you know the taj mahal so none of these architects have have outlived their buildings but unfortunately now we're at a time when architects are outliving their building. Yeah. And that is really, really unfortunate. Uh, we, so with our practice, we are always looking at the life cycle of the building, how it, how it does overall. Uh, we also don't look at any sort of fashion, style, trend, none of that. We, we don't, if someone tells us that, oh, here's my uh, Pinterest board, sorry, we're not looking at that. What we're looking at is is a full picture of what the project is, what it what it could be to its to its best, and if it works uh, with with this. So similarly, like uh, the the pandemic, uh, after the pandemic, we're we're going to keep doing that, but with with an even bigger force. You know, we're going to be like, look, you caused the pandemic, and now let's see what we can do about it. So I think everyone should should hold. Uh, each other responsible in that way for what has happened and uh, just just work really hard in ensuring that we are better and better for our planet in the long run. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is the question to all the speakers. Uh, what do you wish you knew when you were starting? Uh, what advice uh, would you give to those who are recently starting in architecture and design? Uh, architect for there, we can start. With you. Um, I think uh, I think that that design scale is um, only like one thing among other aspects we gotta have. I think um, Rafi touched on this matter before, like um, like the ability to like figure out your finances, um, also like in a way to market ourselves, um, like among other other things that are not uh, design related, and um, and also you asked about like advice, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, and um, I guess like 
uh, like we only have been doing this for three years, so I so we are not like into um, deep too. But like um, so far, I guess we always talked about um, like how to like like we should never uh, underestimate on like what the future holds for you. Like I think um, like the three of us didn't actually like prepare the growth of the studio at first like we we didn't expect like in three years we would like multiple the like the team members uh, like in numbers so in a way like we're not fully prepared like we only have like a small space and then we um like we don't have anyone like looking out for our finances we don't have like people like admins to help us so um, I think like if we kind of like if we are able to like um, back to the past, we would think more about um, like how to anticipate growth. So I think it's more to like um, um, like you should expect the worst, but you also should expect for the best. Like I think like what we did, we only like expect for the worst, but we didn't expect for the best. So it's like, it's been pretty um, uh, exciting though to, to, um, to have that. Take it up, eh? um, What advice that made my life easier? I don't know, it's been such a long journey I can't even remember. Maybe um, that you'll have to work really hard if I had known I had to work so hard, I probably wouldn't have become an architect. Um, advice to give, <laughs> advice to give. I mean, like our, our reward, um, our reward, like generally um, the, when you design something, you only see it a couple of years later. So that patience and reward, if only I'd known uh, to be more patient, I guess that would have helped. Advice I would like to give to um, younger architects, learn everything. Uh, don't be arrogant. Um, if someone tells you to make a bill of quantities, don't say that's not my job. I think um, do everything. If someone says do a detail, design the detail. I think uh, always take up a challenge and try to be as well-rounded as possible because all these different tools help in the end. Thank you, thank you. Architect Shweta and Architect Prana. Mm. I wish when we were starting out, I knew how, uh, like just human psychology, you know, just knowing the person, like it's come through experience over the years. It's also, it's not just clients, it's contractors and people who supply material to you. It's just a whole different ball game after you spent all of this time designing it to actually get it built off the ground and, you know, to have a successful project. So it's just, uh, you know, we've had a couple of bad experiences, just taught us a lot of things. So just, uh, you know, you're young, you're naive, you just think, you know, people are just saying what they mean, but they don't sometimes. So just, yeah, learning that. And I don't know, my advice to a lot of like interns who come to us and a lot of young architects is just, I would say it in Bob Dylan's words, you know, like, you don't need a weatherman to tell you which way the wind is blowing. Like, get out there, you know learn by doing and so keep on doing you're going to make mistakes but that's how you're going to learn and so many of the young people who come to at least to our studio are just a little you know uh, maybe protected by their families or what i don't know but they just just go out there and keep on exploring and doing you know so yeah i mean life's the best teacher so to experience it on your own yeah, I, I agree with everybody and uh, and uh, I would, you know, say the same, uh, but I think I don't have anything more to say, but uh, when, when like five years ago, maybe we, we did a, our first store for Ritu Kumar and oh. uh, yeah, and uh, I, 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 I don't think either of us is scared of anything or anything <laughs> like that. We're, we're quite bold people generally, but uh, Mrs. Kumar was sitting with us and we were, we were just having a good like a talk actually after after it was done. And she looked at me and said, don't be afraid. 
she actually drew it and she she wrote a message she, she to actually it. drew so, something <laughs> in my sketchbook so for for the and rafe ritu kumar is a famous uh, uh best designer fashion designer, designer, fashion designer. Here, and she's she's quite old and she's like one of the oldest fashion designers in india uh, and and yeah she's amazing uh, but, yeah. but that is what i learned from her and, and i've been even more not afraid after that yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you nikita so this to architect rafe so you did emphasize on the importance or relevance of drawing and uh, so nowadays we see less of drawing happening or maybe like let it be students or practitioners they go towards other mediums so how uh, how much does drawing extend your imagination and appreciation towards things one and secondly so uh, draw, the actual drawing on a paper or a piece of sheet versus digital drawing or rendering like so how do you see both of them um, i think drawing is very important um nowadays people are too used to designing in sketchup or, or autocad or in digital medium and what happens is that you are limited by the the tools that are there so in sketchup you'll notice everything is in boxes or square forms and in the old days older buildings are more ornate because they're hand drawn so it's easier to draw a curve than a straight line and i think it's um drawing is basically a conversion or a tool to bring your ideas from your mind to a piece of paper and the beauty of that is there are no rules there are no limits you can do whatever you want and then from there you can start making something uh, more concrete out of it um i think both things are very important but i feel that um drawing is better for initial ideas and then you can always use softwares to make it more um physical um the second part what was the second part uh like so about the traditional drawing on a piece of paper and versus digital drawings and renderings like so how do you see the difference in impacts um drawing is more personal and when you draw um you get more ideas you you understand it better even if you're supposed to draw a detail um but for clients clients apparently don't understand drawing so for the mass people they want 3d's and renders and something realistic so i guess we need to find a, a balance if you treat it as an art i would say drawing but for something commercial 3d view they need the 3d view <laughs> Yeah, all right. So this is one last question to all. Like, okay, not last. We have few from the audience poll, but before that, like, how important do you think it's to have cross-disciplinary or cross-border conversations within different practices and different walks of life, like from different people? So yeah, we can start with the uh, Pran architect Pranav and Shweta. Yeah, um, the whole premise of okay, no, continue. No, I I was going to say that it's critical. If 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 you don't have this, then you're making something in your own box with your own mind and without without thinking about anything or any other factors. So uh, I think our our first collaborators are are the people who we work with, like the. the contractors and and uh, you know masons and all these guys who we actually collaborate with we, so we don't really we we just have an idea of what we're going to do and then we call them and we have these intense discussions with them on how to make it so it it doesn't uh, you have to have collaboration and uh, even even in places where you don't think it's a collaboration your client is still a collaborator so it could be the the only some object but your client is still your collaborator so it's very very important to have collaboration i think shweta is going to say something a lot of times collaboration always uh, you know ended up in us innovating something you know that which was which we never thought of because the whole premise of our studio was to always like be hands on with design and be a design and build studio so that hence we do a lot of models with actual materials so at that time the carpenter 
say the Andaman uh, model. So, you know, we cast it in concrete. It's just, we are always collaborating with people because there's something that we haven't thought of and that adds value to the project. So I think collaboration is key, you know, and that has been with us since day one. So, yeah. And cross-border, yes, we are hoping to, you know, sometime work with Fozia or Rafe on any of the projects in either of the cities or they coming to Bombay. So we're always open to collaborating. And I think that is very, very important. I mean, just staying connected with people, I think, uh, as a design community, it's, it's just, even though you don't end up doing a project, just being connected with each other and just having this inflow and outflow of ideas is, I think, I think is a must. And I think that's why uh, DU is doing such a great job of, you know, always trying to get cross-border conversations happening. So it's pretty interesting. All right. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, from uh, architect Fozia. Oh, she doesn't mute. We can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think I um, I completely uh, agree with uh, Pranav and Shweta and that collaboration is critical. And um, I think I want to also point something about, um, like I personally feel that, uh, at least for me, like architecture, our architecture education um, can, tends, us, uh, tends to make us um, like jack of all trades, like we, um, like, you know, like we are used to do everything like by ourselves. We do the model, we do the construction drawing, we make, like we lay out our own portfolios, make our own websites and uh, all of those things. And uh, while I think in the real world, you can actually like make someone do something for you to like collaborate together. And I think, um, yeah, like you can really choose to collaborate with other expertise. Like, um, like for instance, maybe like you can ask um, a graphic designer to do your logo or like uh, collaborate with a lighting designer to uh, like figure out the best lighting, like, you know, because um, uh, like as, as like we all feel that architects are mostly like generalists. So I think it's um, also interesting if, if we have like conversations and collaborations with um, other expertise. So, um, and I think um, when that happens, there, it, like some rich learning would happen like between us. Like, so um, I think it's like we all like should uh, go towards that direction. Yeah. All right, an architect, Rafi. Collaboration for me doesn't necessarily mean that two people work um, on the same project. Uh, this is my first web seminar and I've learned quite a bit from the other two uh, teams, uh, firms. And I've realized that we all face similar problems. And I think just being in conversation with other architects in different um, areas, but having the same context, you learn so much. And just by talking to them, they can help you address certain problems you're currently facing now uh, that they've already faced, especially with the Pony Granites um, under the, the bus example, I mean, under the highway bridge, that's a, a problem we face. And I think just being in conversation, you can just um, learn so much and, and our cultures are the same. And I think that's just enough. Uh, just, just by talking, you can make life so much easier. And I'm sure the, the political problems that they face would be very similar to the problems I would face if I was to go to, uh, to do the same project. And just by talking, I can learn so much. So I think it's a very, uh, it's a great initiative uh, by DU and uh, I'm hopefully going to try to listen to all the rest of them as well. Uh, thank you guys for having us and arranging this event. Thank you. Thank you. We have one uh, audience question for Studio Pomegranate. Uh, the Andaman project which you showed, where in Andaman it is located and when it will be completed? <laughs> <laughs> Someone is excited to come stay there, I think. 
uh, it's in it's in a it's in the middle part of andaman and uh, i can't tell you where it is because yeah it's incredibly difficult to get there also yeah uh, but yeah it it should be it it may not be completed in the same form uh, and it will be a bit different and uh, because the pandemic has changed things for us yeah. and uh, but it it will say another 2 years 2 or 3 years and it should it should have some stuff going on out there it will take a long time because like everything else uh, and especially there it's completely inaccessible site uh, we have to get there by boat and stuff so we we're, we're going to try to finish it in 2 or 3 years thank you yeah. over to follow us on instagram to do yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have uh, a lot when we go there. Yeah, sure. Thank you, yes. Studio Pomegranate, uh, Studio Far, and Studio Manjil for the presentation and being in conversation with us today. I'll hand it over to Sakshi. Thank you. Um, hi. So I actually have a question uh, for Architect Cafe. Uh, firstly, I really enjoyed seeing your drawings. I think they were so detailed and they were so telling. Um, all right. in fact it sort of reminded me of a concept that i studied in college which was um called hostile architecture which was a lot of what you were talking about where um you know um urban planners intentionally use uh certain unpleasant design techniques to limit or deter uh certain activities in a city um for example homelessness and stray animals and other things so um I was just wondering I was curious because um how would you or what would what is your take on you know as architects how can we make our urban spaces friendly and more inclusive without really compromising on like maintaining order and uh, safety and restricting su- such um you know so called uh, nuisance activities that's that's the challenge and i feel that there is a balance between both of them um we should always try to um design in a certain way and these nonsense activities of of probably bum sleeping in certain areas there's still people and why can't we design in a way that we facilitate it they're human beings um i think architecture should instead of trying to avoid certain aspects should encourage it and try to make it in the form of um art or pleasantry um there's there's a street in in ghent in belgium that is purely um it's purely it's called graffiti street it's graffiti street it's purely for artists and you can do as much graffiti as you want and it's legal and this is an example where these certain behaviors you're encouraging it and you're making it part of the architecture and the beauty of that street is every time you pass by it uh, it changes the dynamics or the colors of the design keeps changing i i hope that answers your question yeah absolutely actually you brought a whole new perspective which was why don't cities actually accommodate and encourage and celebrate um you know certain aspects and yeah i think that's it's a very like insightful thing thank you you know if, if i may add uh, i think design should be an enabler and not an inhibitor mm-hmm. you know and that that is and there's no case where you can see why you should you know you should stop like you know uh, you should put those spikes the spikes for people or for birds uh, or for animals i mean it's just it's horrible and you should never do that absolutely thank you with that we end our moderation session Uh, I hand over to Kavindu to close. Um... Thank you, architects Fazia, Rafi, and Prana for your wonderful presentation, and more importantly, the engaging conversation. Our thanks to Conch- uh, Conchita and Josefa for connecting us to Fazia and Rafi. Our enthusiastic moderators today, Nikita and Chinar, our audience, DU, VSLA, Clayworks team. Um, have a great evening, Kavindu from the. Design United team will um, share the upcoming series of events.
Uh, thank you, Arctic Sherta, Pranav, Foza, and Rafe for your wonderful presentations today. Uh, thanks to our moderators, Nikita and China, for an interesting and thought provoking conversation. Um, we'd like to extend our gratitude to ClearWorks for supporting this webinar and all of our future webinars. So far, Design United has successfully completed 27 installments of Design Conversations, and we, are we have many more exciting speakers lined up with designers across the spectrum joining us to share their thoughts. Uh, next week for our second reading room session, we're very excited to have author Nao Saito, who will be discussing her book, Travels Through South Indian Kitchens. Uh, we're joined by more great speakers in the following months. Uh, later on in the month, we'll be joined by architect Yantho from Mount Mo uh, Modern Space, architect Junsukino and more. Uh, we're joined by multidisciplinary designers in November. We're pleased to have Studio Karam, the spectacular engineer Deepal Vikramasinghe, who worked with the late Jeffrey Bawa on his Kandalama Hotel. He will be talking about the restoration of the Bentota Hotel. Along with Deepal, we will have the renowned Indian engineer Manjunath with two inspiring um, structural designers. Do also um, fill in a feedback form that will pop up in your browser about today's webinar. Join us and stay inspired. And so follow us on our social media for our, any upcoming conversations. Thank you. Uh, we sorry, we, I was on mute. Sorry, uh, we request the architects to stay back for a bit and then uh, provide some uh, feedback on today's session and um, what your thoughts on Design United as a platform in general as well. Thank you. Um, architect Pranav, I think we can start with you. Yeah, this is great. Uh, hello. Yes, we can hear you. Phones are dying. Yeah, so I, I think I think this session was great and uh, what I mean, I guess in in no, I I, I don't really have any any uh, feedback really at the moment at least. Maybe I'll think of something. I think it was a great session and it's a great idea to bring in people from around the world. Sorry, my puppy is just gotten up from sleep. So, uh, and yeah, I mean, it was amazing to meet people who we otherwise wouldn't, you know. I mean, I know with technology, Facebook, Instagram, it's become easier, but also this initiative makes it you know, uh, much more approachable, at least for students. I think it's a great platform for them to learn from people who've been running their studios or what uh, could be done in a better way and, you know, look at people's research. So, yeah, I mean, a great initiative and I'm going to go look at your YouTube channel for more uh, conversations now. And, yeah, keep it up. I mean, kudos to you all. <laughs> Uh, architect Fozia, would you have any feedback? I'm sorry, um, uh, I don't have like a negative feedback or anything because I think um, I think from um, like the several webinars I I've been before, I think this is like one of the most organized. So I so which I think is like a really uh, good thing, and also I so like um, I'm actually like really happy to like know um, like other peers from um, another country. And I, and uh, so like after seeing the projects, I kind of feel that um, Indonesia is like really similar to like, um, like in India, like looking at um, like Studio Pomegranate's uh, projects, like, uh, like everything seems like similar. And I think like, like I like I can learn a lot from the projects as well, 
and um, like we're excited like in the future if we ever go to like Pakistan or like India like like I know like we have like some friends there so we can like go to see the studio or in or something else so um, yeah it's been exciting and um, and I think like this uh, like I've been watching like some of um, like the conversations as, as well in uh, in YouTube and I feel um, like the DU team has done a great job and um, like uh, having like a collection of like very different practices like not only architecture but also other things and I think like um, like somehow everything can like complement each other and uh, make a, like a really good uh, like variations to learn from. Yeah, I guess that's from me. That's great. Thank you so much. We'd like to thank, thank all of the speakers on behalf of the entire DU team, as well as the moderators. You guys did a brilliant job today. And we hope to stay connected because at its essence, DU is about community. So hope to keep in touch with all of you. And on that note, we will end the call now. Thank you. Bye-bye.